Welcome to the Lee Labrada Show. Welcome back, everybody. My guest today is one of the most successful nutritional coaches and has worked one-on-one with celebrities, athletes, and everyday people. He's not only a pioneer in eating for athletic performance, he's also an expert in eating disorders and treating obesity. He's the founder of the Institute of Eating Management and has been a consumer advocate for over 30 years, exposing food industry scams. He's developed a system of eating that focuses on relapse prevention. And he does that by getting into the head of his clients and helping them to reprogram their habits. So I'm very privileged to count him as one of my very best friends. I admire his unique, positive outlook. And without further ado, Keith Klein, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for having me, Lee. Appreciate it. Good to be here. So glad that you are here. Keith, you and I go way back. I I mean, and I know that I'm dating ourselves here, but we go Mm -hmm. back over 40 years, our history together. And Keith was my nutritionist back in the day when I was competing in the Mr. Olympia uh, competition as a professional bodybuilder. But Keith, you are... You are a bodybuilder yourself at heart. You started out as a young man wanting to put on muscle size and and uh, and and gain weight. And why don't you tell us uh, that that story that you that you shared with me earlier about your first foray into a gym? You know, I so desperately wanted to be big, and I couldn't read enough muscle magazines. And like so many of the listeners, you know, where do you learn what you need to learn? And I. I, man, I just, I wanted to be huge. I I dreamt it, slumped it, but my problem was, um, I thought the more you train, the bigger you got, and nutrition wasn't even within the realm of my thinking. So I would literally train for three hours after school, and then go eat dinner and go down and train for two to three hours more. Yeah, we, we all did that. Yeah. You know, more is better, right? But I was 120 pounds at six <laughs> feet tall, getting thinner, right? I managed to put on a little bit of weight, but not much. And I became so desperate, I went down to Powerhouse Gym in uh, downtown Detroit. And I went. I was going down there to buy some weights for my gym because I had a gym in my basement. And when I walked in, I saw a guy across the gym who was ginormous and he had everything I've ever wanted to have. I had never seen 21, 22 inch arms before until that guy. And as I stood there, uh, a a salesperson comes up to me and says, can I help you? I said, no, I want to talk to that guy. (laughs) And he goes, well, he's busy. I said, I want to talk to the big guy. Yeah, I said, I don't care. I want to talk to that guy. When he was done, his name was Will Davish, one of the Davish brothers of the big powerhouse gym, right? That's right. One of the the, the founders of the powerhouse gym. So anyway, I'm standing behind the counter when he walks over and he's got those huge arms, thick chest. And he says, "Uh, can I help you? I said, yeah, I want to know how you get that big. He said, are you asking me how I got this big or do you want to know how you can get this big? I said, I want to know how I can get that big. He said, okay, listen carefully because I'm going to tell you this once. He reaches under the counter and pulls out two pieces of paper. He slides the first one in front of me and it says, I have to train this way. I look at the paper and it's like, that's easy. Cause it's asking me to like, I'll, I'll be done with that in 45 minutes, right? Not six hours, right? right? That I can do. So that's the first shock that yep. you're having to cut your training yep. back. So that was the first lesson. The second thing he slid in front of me was a, 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 a an eating program. And you see, I was eating three meals a day and I was eating my mom out of house and home. But this thing said I had to eat six times a day. Wow. Now, so what did you think of, of well, that? I didn't like, any, you're, you're thinking like, how, how on earth am I going to get all that food I would down? have eaten cow manure. I would have found cows around <laughs> with a loaf of bread if you told me that made you bigger, <laughs> right? right? But when I looked at the last meals where I had the problem, it said I had to eat a quart of cottage cheese every oh. night before bed. And I absolutely hate cottage cheese. Still, to this yes. day. Oh, yeah. Can't stand so, it. But anyway, I was so desperate, I started doing that. And do you know there were times when I would literally be eating the cottage cheese, I'd throw it up. Oh, my gosh. And then go back and eat it again. I was right. that. But All listen right. to All this. Right. All right. So you're, you're like doing whatever it takes. I, I'm desperate like so many people, right? And this is how we get caught up in buying things we don't need, right? And right, right. But listen. I gained 20 pounds in six months. 20 pounds. And I was lean. And you were getting stronger. Yes. And you were seeing muscle visibly. No steroids. Yeah, yeah, not. Visibly everywhere. Muscle muscle growing. And that was the first eye-opening experience I had of the power of food. See, so here I am training less, eating more, and realizing I'm getting bigger and lean. Everything I wanted started to come my way. Now, Keith, let me ask you. Do you think that that uh, that, that, uh, experience set you on a lifelong journey oh, absolutely. you know to uh study and learn more not only about how to put on muscle for yourself but to help other people 
to uh, to uh, put on weight. Well, here's the thing: when you're 120 pounds, you're six feet tall. You don't have high self esteem. You don't have a high self confidence, right? Uh, you're just a fly in the wall when you walk in the room. No one's paying attention to you. You know, the bigger I got, uh, the more people noticed me. Right. And the more people noticed me, the bigger I wanted to get. <laughs> so you see, it was a cycle. But here's the thing. What I learned about, I took every nutrition class the college had to offer. I went on to get extensive degrees in it. But the thing is, what I learned about food was so powerful, not just because of the fact that I was gaining muscle, but what it did to my personality, mm -hmm. right? I became more confident. Uh, I, I walked differently. Right. People recognized me. People it, paid attention right, to me. Right. It's a great confidence. Builder. I wanted other people to experience that too. Whether you're overweight or trying to gain muscle didn't matter. I just knew that if you ate better, you look better, you feel better, you are better. That's right. You know? That's and right. And people notice it. Yep. And so people start noticing your build. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're 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 thinking of maybe about competition at this point. Well, you know what? I, I entered my first show is way back in the '80s. I won every show I ever entered. You know, and I I did that all the way That's to amazing. the Mr. Texas show. And uh, but you know what? At the end of the day, um, I didn't get the the total thrill out of competing like a lot of people did because I felt like there was too much self-adulation involved for me, mm -hmm. right? People are cheering for my body, but I absolutely loved getting other people ready for shows. So when did you actually first start getting people ready for shows? Because right now, you know, or at, at that point in your life, I should say at that point, you know, you're, um, you're focusing on yourself, you're competing, you've mastered that, but you're looking around and saying, there's got to be more than this, right? Well, so what, what, what brings you to the point where you actually start helping people get ready for a show? Well, here's the thing, getting people ready, the athletic dietetic, right, is what I call it, came later. Where I started working was at the Institute of Specialized Medicine, mm -hmm. where what we were working with was diabetic patients, heart disease patients, high blood pressure, and all that medical stuff. But to do that, did you have to go get a degree? Or oh, yeah. How, how, did, how did that work? Yeah. So I have my degree as a CN, which is a certified nutritionist. Okay. And then I went on to get the CCN, which is the certified clinical nutritionist. So there's certified nutritionist, then certified clinical nutritionist. Okay. And so working in that environment, I headed up the entire diabetic ward of that whole whole place. So you're a bodybuilder and uh -huh. you're put in charge of the diabetic ward. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that works. Well, what, what, here's what's fascinating. To work with diabetic patients was exactly what bodybuilders needed to do, which how, I discovered that how, when you ate smaller, that? frequent meals, okay. spreading them out, uh, that not only did the diabetic patients get their blood sugar, a lot of type twos were no longer diabetic after eating that way. They all started losing weight and looking better. Right. And that's when I started to work on the ideas of what I call nutrient partitioning. I came to realize that the human body can only assimilate so much fuel at one time. Right. And the reason why you can't have a diabetic eating once a day is because they can only assimilate so many nutrients, grams of protein at one time. Right. Not to mention that also that their blood sugar goes through the roof. Right. 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 So here's what I saw. When I was working with those diabetic patients, almost all of them ate one or two times a day, and they were all massively obese. Right. Right. So let's be clear. The average, let's just take the average woman. I think she can handle about 350 calories at one time. If okay. she works in out. One, in one meal. At one meal. Okay. Now this is an average woman. That this is a woman is working Exercising out. or an average woman off the this street? This is a person who wants to get lean. Okay. Uh, gain muscle. Okay. Work out. Have more energy. Okay. Okay. She's going to assimilate about 350 calories at one time. But what if she eats 700 at one time? Well, well her body can only use 350. So what happens to the rest? Get stored okay. and they get fat. Right. But what is the diet out there telling people to do? Eat 1,200 calories a day and you'll lose weight. Yeah. But she's eating 700 getting fat. Right. Because she can't utilize the fuel efficiently, right? Because most people don't realize that you need to spread those meals out. It's the only way uh, you, know, you can yeah, in, in other words, those calories have to be spread out over okay. several meals. So this is what we came up with with diabetics, right? So we made sure the calorie allotment didn't exceed what their requirements were. Right. Okay? We also understood that they could only handle so many grams of protein at one time. The average woman can handle about 25 to 30 grams of protein, high quality protein at one time. But what happens when she eats 50? The excess gets stored as fat. So you see, utilization is the key. Utilizing all the calories and fuel, yet she could only handle so many grams of carbs at one time and so many grams of fat. Same thing for a male. The average man could probably assimilate about four, if he wants to get lean, 450 calories at one time. And he can probably utilize about 45 grams of protein at one time. Okay. Right? But if he eats 90 at one time and he can only use 45, he's not getting leaner and he's not growing muscle. 
But the moment that I started to put that pattern in, like for diabetic patients, we started a lot of them on four times a day eating, all of their numbers got better. Now, when it moved to more athletic people, that's when we moved into athletic dietetics. So after the Institute of Specialized Medicine, working with diabetic patients, I went to work with a psychiatrist. And as all we did was eating disorders. Now that's, that's a real interesting facet mm -hmm. of dieting and mm -hmm. one that people overlook because a lot of times the habits that we have really make or break our diet, right? Well, you can't change how you look, all right, until you change how you think about what you do with food, right? So this brought a psychological component to my understanding of nutrient partitioning, all right? So prior to the psychiatrist experience, prior to that, I was your typical bodybuilder giving out typical kind of um, dietetic advice. Okay. No, nope, you got to eat the chicken breast. No, nope, you got to eat the baked potato. You, okay. No, nope, be careful with the ketchup, right? More restrictive style. Sure. Okay. Now, when I went to work with a psychiatrist, this was the first time I competed in my very first bodybuilding show. I never had any issues with food whatsoever. And why is that? I never craved. I never binged. How I never did. How do you get around that? Well, I just never had that. Okay. Until I did my first bodybuilding show. Do you know, for the first time, I was forcing myself to do what I'd been asking my patients to do, which was to eat this bland, boring diet every day over and over again. Right, dry chicken breasts. Yeah, and I started to develop cravings for foods I didn't even know I liked. Um, and boy, when I got my hands on foods that I hadn't eaten for three months, it was like a binge fest. And that was the eye-opening experience for me to realize we've got it all wrong, right? If me getting ready for a show on a restrictive diet like this does that to me, how bad is it for normal people? And that's when it changed my entire viewpoint of how we go about getting lean and feeding people, right? The worst thing you can do if you want to get lean is be that restrictive. Now, look, if you're competing for a show, it's a different thing. Right. But, but notice something. When somebody says, I have a binging problem, right? You, you notice most people aren't binging after they ate a meal. No, once once they've uh, once yeah once their appetite is satiated, they get hungry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you see, the small frequent meals totally got rid of hunger. Right. So binging disappears. for a while anyway. Yeah, yeah. binging disappears. Yeah. But the problem and the thing with the bodybuilding diet that it taught me was that that kind of restrictive eating, the redundant eating, bland eating, okay, actually was probably the source of most eating disorders. Interesting. So when I met, now when you say eating disorders, eating disorders as they apply to bodybuilders or just in no, the population at large? Binge purge, okay, right? Binge purge. Uh, anorexia. Remember that most diets start off with a desire to look better. Right. Somewhere along the line, sure. this person we want to change the way we look. Yeah, they're fat or whatever. Yeah. But it's the very institution of diets that creates the problem because they probably didn't have any problems with binging until they started trying to control their weight. Right. Right. So, right. What and, I and so it's, just, it's just kind of like a um, like a knee jerk reaction mm -hmm. to the uh, deprivation. Let's talk about the psychology of deprivation, because okay. I've heard you use that term before. Yeah. So during the years of working with a psychiatrist, that's when I began writing papers. And, and uh, after that, I began writing for magazines, but I was writing in medical journals. And one of them I titled The Psychology of Deprivation, because here's what I noticed. Almost everybody uh, that started a diet almost all of them ended up in this journey. So I started paying real close attention to what they're doing and charting it. Here's what I discovered. The first thing most people do is give up all their favorite foods. And that goes great for a couple of weeks. And then one day they encounter a, a, a trigger, a stressor. And that then triggers the desire to binge. And then once they binge on the food, they feel an overwhelming sense of guilt. And then out of the guilt comes the rationalization. Well, I've blown it now, I might as well really blow it, so what the heck? See, the very fact that they're now really off kilter started because they were too strict and rigid. To begin with. Yeah, so that was a paper called The Psychology of Deprivation to say this to people. And this is where the slitting the other tie is sort of originated. I said to the patient to help them understand this, I said, listen, if you were driving down the road and you got a flat tire, you would never jump out of your car and slip the other three tires. So the flat tire is like, is like when you blow your diet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, and, and for God forbid, you're driving a semi truck when you do that, right? <laughs> so that's a lot of tires. But I started writing materials like that uh, very early on. And I started trademarking, copywriting and, and these things because I felt like this is something that people need to understand that if you're going to be on this strict, rigid of a diet, 
you're, you're going to end up having a distortion with food. Now, most bodybuilders don't develop eating disorders. What they develop is what I call disordered eating, right? And That's so, interesting. Yeah, because of the experience of competing in a show being so rigid, so strict, which you have to do, they don't have good guidance on relapse prevention after the show's over. Okay. So they've lost control of food. Now they're going to try to return back to the rigidity that they got them in shape. But right. now it's going to make the binge even worse. Right. Right. So you see, at the end of the day, that cycle needed to be broken. So with bodybuilders, we just have to understand the food's always going to be there. Sure. Right. You, you develop the sense that if I don't get that food now, it's not going to be there because look, dining for a show can be painful. Unless right. you know the way that you and me do it, right? Right. Because right. we we've discovered a whole other way where it doesn't have to be that way. It never need. But because that diet was so painful, and all human behaviors are rooted in the pain pleasure principle, right? We move towards pleasure and away from pain. When they return back to that rigid diet, it's so painful they can't they can't stick with it. Right. Right. It's painful, so they have to move away from that to get back to pleasure. And it's two big extremes. That's just amazing. But man. that's when I came up with better bad choices because I had to teach these people with eating disorders some way to come back to incorporating bad foods and feel good about it. Right. So the invention of better bad choices was another paper I wrote that, look, we cannot suggest that people should be purist with food. We have to give them moderation. And that's something that's been here forever. Right. But to teach these people a new way of moderation, that was where I came up with better bad choices. Right. That listen, if you want some ice cream, go ahead and have some ice cream. But there's three ways here that you could have it and still lose your weight. Well, what's that? Well, one, eat less of it when you do. Okay. okay. Not always. Portion, portion control. Yeah. Two, make a better bad choice. Instead of that high fat Haagen-Dazs, which has 1,200 calories, eat this light version of ice cream that only has 200. You satisfy the urge to eat it, but you knocked out a thousand calories. You've done so much better, but you still enjoy the bad choice. Right, right. And the third way is so to- The lesser of the two evils, yeah, so to speak. And the third way was to decrease the frequency. Okay. You know, so even with people that I worked with who were drinking too much, I never said, you know, you can't drink. At all. No, never. I, I don't do that. So what I would say is, what do you believe that you could cut that back to and still live with it? So people would say, well, I could have alcohol twice a week. Well, that's better than seven. Right. And that's a place to start. And that's right. how we even do it. Don't give up red meat. But if you're eating it seven days a week and it is identified as a problem for your weight, could you do it twice a week? That's yeah. And that's, instead of a 16 ounce, let's do a 10 ounce. Yeah. And instead of a high fat cut, let's do an extra lean cut. So ch changing changing habits and reframing, reframing the, um, the, uh, the uh, patterns that they're involved in. You know, so either whether it's either portion mm -hmm. control or, you know, cutting back on the frequency, you know, the number of times that they do it. Well, if you pay attention to what I just said, and I know you did, what you'll notice is I've never focused so much attention on controlling their food. What my uh, thing is, is to pay attention to controlling your thoughts. Because if you don't have control of your thoughts, you don't have control of your food. Or anything for that matter. Well, most people don't realize the connection. See, in the typical relapse prevention model, it's abstinence. So if you want to get rid of gambling, drinking, drug addiction, you're best just not to touch it. Right. The problem with that model is that cannot be applied to food because we have to use food to survive. Right. So you can't start with it. You have to eat. Yeah. You can't start with an abstinence approach. It will never work. It only lead to binging and, you know, and so... I see people gravitating away from just normal common sense with food and that reframing, as you call it, or relapse prevention, I recognize I have to implement that from the very beginning of our first discussion. Right. And that's where better bad choices help them because it took us away from the abstinence model and put them in control of the food because it's all about choices. Right. So, you know, for years, whether I'm a bodybuilder or not, when I would go into Beck's Prime to get a hamburger, I always got a kitty burger. It was a lot of food. You got the, the, the off the children's menu. Yeah. I'd eat the kitty burger with uh, diced onions, a Port, lettuce, tomato, and mustard, and love control. it. But I, ne I never lost my abs doing that. Right, right. Now, if I'm eating that 1,200 burger, but my, my point is, that kitty burger is what we should, a size we should normally be eating to begin with. Right. In America, portion sizes have gotten so large and out of control that what most people think is a portion size right. is way more than they should be eating. Right. Uh, just look around America, compare America today from about 1970s, early 70s, 
and look at the rate of obesity. It's mm-hmm. just an upward trend. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's just amazing. Keith, we're going to take a short break. And, okay. we'll, and when we come back, I'd like for you to talk with us about the Institute of Eating Management. Okay, you bet. Okay, ready? Okay, and we're back. So Keith, we were talking about the psychology that's involved in reprogramming all of these eating habits and, mm-hmm. and, and the like. And so you've worked with you at that point in your life, you worked with a, psych, a psychiatrist right. and you learn a tremendous amount about how powerful the mind is you right. know, in terms of determining eating habits and your success or lack thereof on a diet. So what is next uh, there on the career path for you? What do you do then? Well, the first physician that I was working with at the Institute went to prison for 20 years oh for income gosh. tax evasion. So, okay. <laughs> and so I had left right before that. So he got paid for a lot of diets and yeah, didn't pay taxes yeah. on it, huh? Um, the second, the psychiatrist that I worked with, he just didn't show up for work one day and we didn't have cell phones back then. And he and I had opened five clinics. We had one in Atlanta, Beaumont, Port Arthur, and two in Houston. So what happens to this Well, guy? he didn't show up. So I drove to his house, uh, and I went, his car was there and I looked in all the windows. It looked like he'd been shot in the head. Oh my word. So I break in the wind. It was in his bedroom. I break through the window. I crawl through, oh I call nine one. Well, it turns out he had an ear infection that turned into a brain infection, almost killed him. Okay. But he lost his hearing. Okay. So he didn't shoot himself. No, we were out of business like that. So he, he, uh, literally was just bleeding out the ear. Yeah. He had an ear infection that went into his brain. Okay. And lost uh, his hearing. And he, and he and was unable to keep working with you. And all five of our clinics had to close. So then you say, okay, I'm closing these clinics. What do I do now? Well, um, I had gotten Dr. Ron Preston a job at the Institute of Specialized Medicine, and we both veered away from there at the same time. Uh, We were training partners. And he had a New Year's Eve party uh, one night, and uh, I was just fresh out of business, and I was talking to your sister at that party, Conchita. And a couple of questions I like to ask people around New Year's is, what's the best thing that ever happened to you in 2022? And they'll tell you. Sure. What's the worst thing that happened to you in 2022? And it's often the same thing. Really? I lost my job. I got the best job ever. I got divorced. I met someone A lot of times they're related. Yeah. And then I asked her, what do you hope to have happen in, let's say, 2023? Right. Well, Ron was standing behind me, Dr. Preston, he taps me on the, because she turned to me and said, well, what do you want to have happen to you? I said, well, I hope to have my own clinic one day. Because I just, you know, came through two oh experiences gosh. of losing a business. So you, you just say this. Yeah. And Ron was standing behind And he me, just happens to be behind you. Taps me on the shoulder and says, listen, I've just started a new clinic, uh, the Houston Sports Medicine Clinic. You can own the nutrition department. Let's do it together. You know, Keith, I've always said that there is so much power in words. Yeah. If, if you hadn't been prompted and spoken that out. Mm -hmm. Ron may have never known that you wanted to be involved in a clinic. It shows you the power of expressing goals uh, to the right people. Yes. And the the reason I say the right people is there's some people you should never express a goal to. Sure. Too negative. So immediately the next day I showed up at Ron's office. We had a meeting um, and I started running an office from him inside. And then Kyle Workman came on board with chiropractic. And um, then there was a girl there named M. I forget her full name. She did the massage therapy. So we were the first entity in Houston to bring medicine with sports, with everyday care, with massage, nutrition, and chiropractic One care stop. together. Yeah, it was never so done you had, before. You had a lot of athletes going through there. Oh, yeah. So what happened was that's I was training at Hank's gym at the time. And so I knew most of the local bodybuilders, including you. I had the opportunity to work with you, which really, Lee, I got to thank you because that really set in motion my, because I really wasn't interested so much in working with athletes as much as I was the eating management, obese clientele. Sure. But during this period, you and I worked together. You had massive success. Thank you. Uh, I worked with Carla Dunlap. She won the 1983 Miss Olympia. I did her diet and it just started growing from there. And because I was also a competitor and I got in such superior shape myself and I won every show I did, that also attract a lot of the local competitors to me. Well, Keith, you, you were one of those uh, rare individuals that not only talked the talk, but walked the yeah. walk. Yeah, well, the I fact, thought that was important. Yeah, the fact that you were a competitor yourself, mm-hmm. you know, obviously you had been through it. You were able to glean and learn right. a lot there. So you weren't just book smart. You know, mm-hmm. you you had uh, been raised in, in the trenches of the gym, so to speak. Well, practical. You know, so, so you, you yeah. understood. Yeah, but here's the interesting thing. If you see most of my clients, and I've gotten thousands of people ready for photo shoots. I work with the Hugo Boss models, the Kevin Klein models. It's a long list of, of, of different kinds of people in different the From all walks of life. Yeah, the Miss USA, the Miss Texas, and all that stuff. But if you go to them, even to this day, 
most of them are still in really good shape. And, and, that, and that leads me to something that we're, we're going to want to talk about, something you call relapse prevention. Mm -hmm. but, but keep going. Yeah. And, and so you see the techniques that I started implementing after my experience, my first experience, was to say to people, look, to get ready for this show, you do not have to kill yourself with food. If anybody's telling you to do two hours of cardio a day, your food's not right because I never did more than 20 minutes of cardio. I didn't have to do a lot because my diet was exactly the way it needed to be to get me ripped. And so I started teaching people to do less cardio, to manage their food better, but the big key was their food was tasting amazing. I developed a whole cookbook for competitors. You know what's interesting, bro, is I was in the kitchen, you know, uh, the, uh, the Labrador Nutrition mm -hmm. Corporate Kitchen today, and uh, I was heating up some food, and so was a young lady. You know, and she asked me what I was uh, what I was eating, and I was and I told her that I was eating this uh, this um, one hundred percent ground turkey breast mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Robin, my wife, had made. She's a great cook. She is, you know, and uh, she had made it with a uh, with a sauce and spices and that type of thing. And she goes, "Well, mine's just kind of plain." I go, "Well, it's it's interesting that you, that you uh, that that you bring that up because the thing is, if you're trying to eat plain food all the time, dry chicken breast, yes. dry ground turkey, you know, dry fish, mm -hmm. it, it just it doesn't work because you start running into that whole you know, uh, uh, deprivation thing and, and you don't get the, uh, satiated the way That's that right. you normally do on, on, uh, foods that, that, that taste good. You know, so I, I told her, I actually brought you up. I said, Keith Klein's coming in here today, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, here's, here's a guy that when he got to working with his clientele, figured out very quickly that not only did he have to teach them how to manage their macros, their calories, their grams of protein and so forth, but he had to teach them how to cook. Yes. Yes. So I developed a cookbook, a recipe set of amazing things. Like my clients are eating turkey breast meatloaf, but it tastes like beef meatloaf. Right. I even developed something called Berkey, where I would stir together extra lean ground beef with extra lean ground turkey. Uh, so it would actually taste almost 100% like beef. And yet they feel like they're eating an everyday meatloaf. I made turkey chili, right? I made, I invented the egg white pancake back in 1982. And it's everywhere today. And I published it in Bill Phillips's Muscle Magazine years ago. The is, recipe. That right? is that how it got out? Yep, that's how it got out. But the point is, is that my clients are eating protein muffins that taste amazing, that are pre-contest approved. Now get this, I was eating a grilled lobster tail with steamed asparagus with a baked yam that I made taste like pumpkin pie with some nutmeg and cinnamon in it and some Splenda, okay? Right, right. I was eating that the week of my show when I won the Mr. Texas. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you don't, have to, you don't have to deprive yourself of food that tastes good people, in order to diet. Right, but people pe just get lazy. Well, they don't know this. Yeah. See, they think the worst thing that you can have is a coach or a trainer that gives you this, this blank diet and tells you that you can't have this, you can't have this. You. My focus in my career was never to tell people what they couldn't do. My focus spent all my time telling them all the things they could do. Right. And this opened up a broad spectrum of people who understood early on that they didn't have to experience pain. It changes your paradigm, doesn't yeah, it? When it people focus on what you can do versus what you cannot do. Well, here's the thing. They were getting ready for shows, they were winning shows, and it wasn't painful. So remember that pain pleasure principle. Sure. If something's painful, you're going to move away from it. Right. And that's why so many people don't make it to their shows is because the diet is so deprivative and but painful. What about these? What about these people that uh, that are like dieting with low carbs? You know, in the last uh, couple of weeks leading up to the show, I mean, and they literally feel like they're starving to death. Well, well, how do you address that? I never had to do that. Okay, so that was not my approach for getting people ready for shows. We started test peaking. In other words, a big mistake for a lot of competitors is they wait till the final week and coming into a show, they suddenly change their diet at the end, but they don't know what the outcome will be and they miss their peak. Right. We started test peaking our clients four to five weeks out from a show. I began manipulating the food to see how it altered their appearance for tightness, fullness and all that. And then I would discover, OK, this is your peak. Right. There are only five peaks I, I ever discovered. And my favorite peak for me uh, was I dieted right into the show. If I looked so good on Sunday, I didn't change anything now, when, other than my water and sodium. When you say there's five different peaks, mm -hmm. five different approaches to peaking? Yeah, because no two bodies are alike. Okay. What I discovered is the more propensity someone has for obesity, the better they do on a lower carb ratio leading into the show. Okay. So I never up their carbs before a show because they were very water retentive. 
So that's an endomorphic type physique, right? Somebody who naturally puts on body fat easily. Right. Okay. So that's the second one. Okay. I didn't up their carbs. I actually decreased them before a show and they'd come in tighter and looking better. Okay. Uh, the third one was that I would have them pull back their carbs a little bit out from the show and then bring them up leading into the show, maybe two days or three days before. And then the day before, just pull them back a little bit and they would peak beautifully. Okay. But once they learned their peak, it was their peak. Right. The, and all they had to do then is go back in and modify it a little bit. How did you determine which person would peak better with? By whatever? test peaking, but also by body type. Okay. You know an endomorph when you sure, see them, right? Sure. Uh, and an ectomorph is the skinny guy. Right. You really have to load them up. Right. Right. They require more food. Yeah. Um, so a low carb diet on, a, on an uh, ectomorphic diet just thins them out, makes them look horribly flatten out and all that. Right. So there were just different peaks. Um, now, I don't think there's such a thing as the wrong eating plan mm -hmm. for a person. I think that your eating plan has to be one that you like that works for you, that's sustainable. That's the key, that works yeah. for you and is sustainable. So who would I do? It wasn't a keto-based diet, but it was a higher fat, low carb diet. Mm -hmm. Who would I do that on? You know where I got great results on that is people who travel all the time. Really? Because they eat in restaurants. It's so much easier to order steak and steamed vegetables than it ever is going to be to say, can you do the steak without butter? Okay. Yeah. It's yeah, just, or a dry, dry, uh, dry carbohydrate. It was just well, what's in the rice. Yeah. Well, I've got oil or butter in the rice, so I can't have that. So if I had an obese patient who travels all the time, eats out all the time and doesn't cook, that's where the higher fat, lower carb diet really did work for them. Okay. And they liked it because it was just simple. Right. right? Simple I, to follow. Yeah. So I found that there's just different styles of eating for different types of body types and people. And the key is to find one that they like, that they feel is sustainable. Because yes, whatever you do to get lean is what you got to keep doing to stay lean. Absolutely. Yeah. So coming back to your uh, to your career path. So then you're in this uh, 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 sports medicine complex. Mm -hmm. You guys got this team of people put great. together, and one mm -hmm. stop, you yep. know, and it's like 20 years ahead of its time. Yeah. You know, because uh, I remember that. Mm -hmm. I remember that uh, that clinic. What, what comes next for you? Well, as you know, Dr. Preston killed himself. They were in the clinic. He was having some strong. Keith, bro, you got this pattern of people that like almost kill Either themselves. I'm bad for doctors or they're bad for me. I don't know which. But <laughs> All kidding aside. We, it is true. Yeah, I yeah, mean, we, I we started. Loved, uh, we loved uh, Ron Preston. Yeah, guy. I really started wondering. But he was having marital problems. And there in the office one day, he, he shot himself in the head and, and, and killed himself. And once again, I was out of practice. Uh, I, everything was gone. Everything was swiped out from under me, just like the last time. Right. Right. So this is a story. You know, and that's one of the things that I admire about you is that your ability to rebound. Yeah. You know, because a lot of times people uh, face these things. Heck, we all face challenges. It's you know, a, some some big, some small. Yeah. You know, but, you know, I mean, what uh, what other choice do we have? I mean, we, we can either uh, curl up and, and mm -hmm. blow away or, or we can uh, rebound and move forward, right? It's the story that you hear so often in successful people. It's the story of perseverance. I knew that what I was doing was great work. And I knew that I wanted to keep it growing and going. So even though Dr. Preston, I lost everything. I didn't have an office. I didn't have enough money to go. We, we were together five years, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's when I went ahead and opened the Institute of Eating Management and Relapse Prevention Center. And okay. I... So did you just get up one day and say to yourself, okay, practice is closed. What do I do now? I get it. I'm going to open up the Institute of Eating Management. Well, you know, the day he killed himself, uh, my my brother's wife came down with cancer uh, three months before my, or no, not three months, three weeks before my show. Okay. So I canceled that show. Okay. And you I had another one. Show. Yeah, I had another yeah. one set up for June 3rd and Dr. Preston killed himself yeah. just that week. So you're not doing too good on a, on a, uh, in terms of your personal life at that point. Just a, just a, a lot of terrible things <clears throat> happening. Yeah, but you know what? I never felt like it was a bad time for me, you know, because I didn't do these things, right? I wasn't responsible for them. I had a really positive attitude, but I decided for that show, I wasn't going to cancel because Ron decided to do that. And I devoted the show to him. Okay. And that was the Mr. Texas. Okay. Yeah. And so I won that show. And then I had to get started opening up my own place. And the sure. first thing I did, because I didn't have much money, is I opened up inside of an executive suite that had offices in Paris, New York, LA. And so if I left the country, I'd have an office anywhere I went. Interesting. Yeah, but I stayed did there. You, did you tap into that when you were traveling? Did you go? Not much, you but it was the, a nice luxury yeah, to have. Sure. But I didn't know executive offices existed. Okay. So uh, here I am, I open up an executive office. I just have to pay rent and pay secretaries. And 
So now you got to realize I'm making the most money I've ever made. Okay. And so at so, the end of that so year. So you tur you're turning uh, lemons into lemonade. Yeah. Okay. And this terrible situation, what comes out of that is you open up your own practice mm -hmm. and you're now doing better than ever. Yeah. And so, and I was working a lot though. You know, I just didn't feel like I could take a break. So my diet was waning and my training was suffering a little bit. Right. But that's when I had enough money then to open my own in the same building. I just went up a floor and opened up my own office and things just. Right. really started thriving. And and so was it a lot of walk-in traffic, word of mouth? No, how, so, how did you get the word out about your business? Well, I had a radio show, right? Uh, I started that doing helped, radio. That helped a lot. Yeah, I had started doing radio in the 1980s uh, through the 90s up until the early 2000s. I did about 13 years. Uh, I was also doing the health beat uh, reporting on the news. Okay. And I was also lecturing on a lecture circuit with uh, Norman Schwarzkopf, Jim Rome, Brian Tracy. So you were getting in front of a lot of people. And I was writing books. And, right? and writing mm -hmm. books. You know, you were getting Busy. out there. You, you were not wasting any time, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, create, creating value for people. Right. Creating and that's value. how I started really writing for the muscle magazines. Yeah, you know, with Bill Phillips. That's right. Yeah. That's I started, right. I, I had, I read a little book, great book called, um, Guerrilla marketing. And I think you might have told me about it. Uh, is that the uh, uh, Levinson or Conrad? Yes. Yeah, and yeah. it was a long time. Yeah. It said start a newsletter. Yes. So I started a newsletter. You started a newsletter. And, uh, and of course, I, back then it was an analog newsletter, right? Yeah. Was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And back then, uh, I noticed when I was walking into the gym, there was a guy on a truck with these health and fitness magazines putting them on racks in the gym. And I stopped and I said, hey, uh, do you deliver all of these to all the gyms? He said, I do. I said, well, is there any way I could give you my newsletters and you could do it? And he goes, yeah, here's the name of the company. Well, I, I had 16,000 people uh, reading that uh, newsletter. newsletter. Mm -hmm. And then Health and Fitness Magazine saw my newsletter next to their magazines. Right. And they came and said, Keith, why don't you just write for us? Right. You know, we got a greater distribution. We're Texas wide. You're just Houston wide. So. Right. I started writing so for them. So you started writing a column for them. Then and I that became, And that brought you some clients. Yeah. Then I, 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 I did something called the body buck in the back, right? Okay. And I did a little coupon for, but here's the point. Because I was writing my thoughts and ideas on eating management, people were reading my thoughts mm -hmm. and they said, you know what? I need to see that guy. Right. So I wasn't selling anything in there. I was just simply saying, this is what's wrong with the diet industry. And that's when I started the consumer activism stuff. Yes. I started lab testing foods, yes. discovering that they were not, and supplements that weren't what they so, were supposed so to be. So I know, I know that uh, about your history, mm -hmm. being a consumer advocate, you know, and what are like some of the most egregious things that the, the first one or two that popped to your head that the food industry does, you know, that really is kind of misleading to the public. It's to tell the the people that a food is a percentage fat free. Like when you see 93% fat free, 7% fat, most people have no idea that is the same fat content like on, as like T-bone steak. Like on the turkey or something. Yeah. So if I, if I pick up a package of turkey at the grocery store and it says 93% fat free. Very high fat food. Okay. How is that possible? Because they're referring to the product's fat by weight, not its fat by calories. So it's 7% fat by weight. Right. And that's a, a whole different ballgame. Well, they're doing this deliberately. Sure. So you see the people that help set up the, the labels of our food, which is uh, the meat industry and dairy is regulated by the USDA. Hmm. They have a team of people that set it up. Well, their job is to protect and help thrive the meat and dairy industry. They know that when you see a product labeled 93% fat food free, and then in big bold letters, 7% fat, you're going to think that food is 7% fat. By calories. Yeah, but it's not. But it's not. It's by weight. It's 45% fat. Which works out to 45% yes. fat. Oh so what gosh. you have to do if you, so this is why it was so important. That was another part of eating management was label education. So you, how, you teach clients how to read the labels oh, and figure time. those things out. Because if they don't know what to eat, see, this is part of the mental part. Sure. When I show you that water-packed tuna is 40% fat because of the time of year it's caught, and you always just, the, the walls come down. Wait, wait, what I mean? Water-packed tuna can't how be high fat. Yeah, because of the time of year they catch the fish. So during that time of year, the fish accumulate more fat, more fat. so they can yeah, in water. the migration. Yeah. So okay. that was one of the things that, you know, I wrote about muscle media and those sure. other, right? Sure. But the point is, is that once I start to show them that the foods they thought were good to eat to get lean on never were, then their brain opens up a little bit of what we call NLP, you know, neuro linguistic programming. Sure. To what, what, if I've been fooled by this. What else am I fooled by? Right. And I'd show them five or six things because I took notes. Right. And when they would tell me what they're eating, one by one, I'd say, let me just show you this. Now, here's what you want to eat instead. Right. See, so knowledge is power.
It's just, um, it's uh, um, amazing. Now, not only not only were you a consumer advocate, but um, you being a nutritionist, you know, had some challenges right. from the dietitians mm -hmm. in the state of Texas. Yeah. So what happened was uh, uh, th there's different entities in medicine and you have to carve out your niche from the medical community. So the RDs did a good job carving out their niche and they got what's called a practice act passed. Okay. So, so, that, so, so like a legislative act yeah, it's a, it's passed a, by the correct. state. Okay. Well, one day I, I'm on the radio show and I get a call from somebody who says uh, it was a registered dietitian who didn't like what I did, I guess. But she said, I just want you to know that come Monday morning, a week from Monday, you're out of business. I said, she, excuse she me. She opens up by saying yeah. that you're going to be out of business. Yeah. That sounds like a threat. Yeah. And I said, excuse me. She goes, yeah, the law was just passed in Texas that says uh, nobody in the state of Texas can practice nutrition anymore without the designation RD. My designation is CN and CCN, right? Okay. I didn't know what she was talking about, but I work with very influential people. At that same time, Ken Benson, who was a senator, was my client. I worked with his entire staff. I worked with George Bush's, who was governor at the Times, family. And I worked with a lot of politicians, Rodney Ellis. I just, you know, I had these guys as clients. Sure. Right? sure. So I picked up the phone and, and I you, called you call them and you asked called him. Ken Benson's office and Pat uh, picked up the phone. She said, I don't know anything about it. Let me check. She called me back 15 minutes later and said, do you know that they passed a law in this last legislative session just this week that she's right? And I was shell shocked. And that meant they made it illegal for even a personal trainer to discuss diet with their clients. Okay. Because this is what a practice act does. Oh my goodness. So, so what do you do? So here's what I did. I, I, I talked. I needed help. So I asked Ken Benson, what do I need to do? And he set up a meeting with me and then Governor George Bush. And I went out to Governor George Bush's uh, office and explained to him what this really meant. And he had no idea. So he actually, while I was there, picked up the phone on speakerphone. So you get an audience mm -hmm. with the then governor, right. George Bush, and you're mm -hmm. explaining the situation. This is my you. first experience on political anything. Right, right. So I'm sitting there and um, on the speakerphone, the gentleman who brought the bill to the uh, legislative body, right? There's a senator who carries the bill. Okay. He was on the phone and... Um, Governor George Bush said, I want you to listen to what this guy's saying. And I went through it. I said, do you realize that this puts every single nutritionist in the state of Texas out of business? He said, I had no idea. He said, I just thought this was a practice act for RDs. I didn't know it had any effect on anybody wow. else. I said, listen, in my practice alone, this is how much tax dollars I pay every year. Why don't you multiply that times 900? Because there's 900 of me, uh, CCNs, in the state of Texas. And you can see how much revenue the state's going to lose when this finally goes through next Monday. Wow. And he said, you know what? He said, that sounds like a bad bill to me. And uh, Governor Bush said, sounds like a bad bill to me. And he vetoed it. <laughs> he vetoed it. Right there. Had she not called me and told me that, it would have passed because nobody knew. That was my first entry into politics. Yeah. So we got that thing vetoed. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just... Um, um, it, it's just so interesting to see all of the dynamics, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at, at work there. And, well, that uh, became a 10 year war. You know, we kept fighting. So it out. kept going. Oh, yeah. Every two years that act kept coming up. OK. And what did you do? Every two years I went back out to the uh, com health committee, health select committee and got so, before so them. So they speak. kept fighting and fighting for it. But what happened is finally the legislators, the health committee finally said, look, don't bring that bill to us anymore. You know, it's just a waste of your time. We're not because every time they got shot down. Right. Yeah. Now, look, um, I do believe in the ethical side because there's good doctors and bad doctors. Sure. But there can also be good nutritionists and bad nutritionists. I get that. Right. You know, so I, I it's like anything else. Yeah. But once you draw the government in to regulate the whole body, it just gets even messier. So it's 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 uh, I was fighting for everybody's right in the state of Texas to be allowed to discuss food. At what point? In our world, does discussing food become illegal? Exactly. They were going to fine you two thousand dollars a day. And that's something. Were yeah, that is just mm -hmm. something. Well, I'm glad that you got uh, through that uh, uh, unscathed. And obviously, you had to put a lot of uh, had to put a lot of work mm -hmm. into it. It was a stressful time of my life because uh -huh. my career was being threatened. Yep. But it was an amazingly great time of my life. I was challenged 
like I'd never been challenged before. Isn't, isn't that something, mm-hmm. you know, how a lot of times we get backed into a corner, yeah. you know, and we have, and we have challenges, yeah. you know, and uh, if you just look for the opportunity, you know, rather than, uh, you know, looking at the ground, I say, look up, yeah. you know, and uh, you, you can find, you know, a, uh, a way forward. And sure. a lot of times what you gain from it is, is much greater than, than the perceived setback initially. Yeah, we really gained, you know, what that ended up creating with Winna Henry and Rada Rastow and uh, just a great group of people. My lawyer at the time had recommended, his name is Rick Jaffe, and he's an, an amazing guy. He said, listen, Keith, you can't keep fighting this thing. And he went to uh, Rada Rastow, was a big player in this. Winna Henry, head of the CCN, was a big player. And they, they put together something called the Texas Freedom Health Coalition. So what happened was it was just me and a handful of CCNs going out there to fight this thing every year. Right. Well, by the time we got to this 10th year, we were over 50,000 strong because we, we, we went to everybody and said, listen, if you're a CSN, a CN, a CCN, an organization, or, yeah, we don't care. You need to know that they're trying to be. And so we became over 50,000 strong. And then I never had to go out to fight it again. That's amazing, Keith. Yeah. And I know that you uh, that you worked with your psych, uh, your um, Institute of Eating Management of, of for many, many years. And eventually that led to a documentary, which I'm, I'm yeah. going to mention mm-hmm. uh, is it's called uh, Beyond Weight Loss. Yeah. And it's available on Amazon Prime and uh, a number of other uh, streaming outlets. It's on almost all the cable stations except Netflix. OK. And mm-hmm. so uh, tell me a little bit about Beyond Weight Loss. Well, I was lecturing one day and somebody in the audience came up to me after named Tom Odar and he introduced himself to me and he said he was shocked. Because he was now beginning to hear all the things he was trying to do to lose weight his whole life just had never worked. And here he was, heavier than he's ever been. But he's done all these diets. But once he heard the lecture, he realized, I've been doing it wrong all this. I had no idea this was going on. And it turns out he's a film guy. And he said, Keith, uh, I would like to talk to you. I'm doing a documentary on food. This kind of information needs to get out. Mm -hmm. See, one of the reasons why it's difficult to get this information out is because the food industry rules the airwaves. So their advertising dollars mean a lot to the television stations, right? And so you can't get on a television station and start talking about the reality of how this company's ripping you off. Right. Because they'll lose their advertising dollars. So he put together the documentary called Beyond Weight Loss. And I didn't produce it. I didn't direct it. I'm just in it. Right. So uh, as I started talking more and more about my philosophies and things like that, the feedback he got on the film was very overwhelmingly positive Mm -hmm. to this side of things. So he came back to me. That uh, came out two years ago. Okay. So beyond now, it, listen, it, it's it's had phenomenal success. Yeah. And for any anybody that's watching this podcast, if you haven't seen it, go watch it right now. You know, beyond well, weight loss, it, it is just it's just really eye opening and entertaining. Yes, it is. So then, what happened is after we did that, you know, we went our separate ways, and uh, it, it got a lot of acclaim. It was pretty cool. Uh, then he called me up and he said, Keith, you know something that's never been done. Nobody has ever talked about relapse prevention before. And I have one of the largest bodies of work in the world on relapse prevention and food. Define relapse prevention for us just in in, in a short definition. Well, when you are trying to follow an eating plan Mm -hmm. and you venture off it for a few days, that's called a lapse. Okay. Uh, A relapse is when you completely chuck everything out the window. You're back to your old behaviors. Okay. All right. But see, the thing is, nobody wants that for themselves. See, the two, to the two dirty words uh, in the weight loss industry that nobody ever brings up, relapse prevention. Because what author wants to write this book about all the uh, weight you're going to uh, lose diet. and how good it's going to go? And then at the end say, oh, by the way, <laughs> when you start to struggle and put your weight back on, here's what you need. Because that's to suggest that their plan won't work. That it, or that it'll fail. In yes. other words, it's not something that's sustainable. But notice something. Right in the words of the title of my clinic, the Institute of Eating Management and relapse prevention. I wanted to bring that to the forefront. And so relapse prevention is helping people change the way they think about what they do with food and exercise. That's, that's uh, phenomenal. Phenomenal. And so the, um, 
the uh, uh, the show, the documentary, the, the uh, Beyond Weight Loss. My understanding is that there's a part two coming out yeah. and um, you're the star of the show. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, what's really cool about this one, though, it's focusing entirely on mm -hmm. relapse prevention. And what Tom had the idea to do is he said, listen, Keith, I'd like to go to maybe eight or nine clients that have seen you that haven't seen you for 15 or 20 years, okay. and but that have kept their weight off. And just see where they're at. I said, yeah, go ahead okay. and go through the books. Now, call. Keith, isn't that, isn't that what you call the after, after? Every, yeah. every, every person that has a diet <laughs> calls it a before and after, right? right? But you call it the after, after. Why, yeah. do, you, why do you say it like what, that? What good is it to show somebody 12 weeks worth of work or three months, right? Mm -hmm. What you should really be most concerned with is what do they look like two and three years later? Right. Because the only way you can qualify a program as to whether it works or not is did they keep the weight did off? Did they keep the weight off? Yeah, so, so I don't, I never put up a before and after picture uh, unless the person has kept the weight off more than five years. Now, right. I have p patients that have lost well over 100 pounds and kept it off for over 20. Right. So I said, call them. Call them all, man. So he found uh, eight or nine of them. I know that there are curious minds out there that want to know what is the secret to keeping it off. Well, the, the way it can only work, whatever you begin to do, and that's where this kind of instruction comes in to show them labels, psychology, uh, what they think they've been doing wrong with food and how to make it work for them. It's all changing the way they think about what they've been doing all along. I think the diet model is ruining a lot of people. Right. I think the diet model creates more eating disorders than anything else. And you'll notice the words eating management. Right. Because what you, you don't have to give up your favorite food. You just need to learn to manage them. Exactly. But understand something, just that small explanation mm -hmm puts people in a different position when they go to change their food. That's right. Because listen, if you made just a few small changes, one thing I do encourage my clients to do is write down the top five things that you think hold you back from getting what you say you want. Mm -hmm. And it could be, I eat out too much. I don't cook. I eat too much red meat. I eat too much fried food, right? I drink too much alcohol. Okay, now there's your list. What I'd like you to do is just take one of those things and focus on that one for two weeks and let's adjust it, not adjust get rid it, of it, not get rid of it, unless they want to. Okay, so diminish it. Yeah, if you're drinking alcohol five days a week, let's cut it down to one or two. Okay, but the key is, I ask up front, can you live with that? Oh right. yeah, yeah. I could. Are right. you saying I can have alcohol and lose weight? Yeah, uh -huh. if you do it this way. Now, you're eating red meat four or five days a week. One thing that I also came to realize when you made that list, mm -hmm. there's always one thing on the list that uh -huh. if you pay more attention to, changes almost all of them. Right. So I believe in the simplicity of weight loss. Keep right? it simple. So here's the one. In, in that list of five, I said, I don't cook enough. In other words, I'm a non-food carrier. Right. What I believe is that when you cook and carry your own foods, you don't eat out as much. You don't eat as much red meat. You don't eat as much fried food. I like that. I like I like that term, non-food carrier. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about is meal prep. Yeah. What we call in in the uh, in the ath uh, athletes call meal prep, right? If They're preparing you, meals and that. And mm -hmm. nowadays, there's so many meal preparation services that will deliver food to your door if you don't want to cook. Right. You know, um, it is easy. But let me say this. So what Tom did is he's filmed eight or nine clients that have lost over 100 pounds and kept it off to get inside their heads, to ask them critical questions like, what did you change? And now what we begin to see out of all of them, there seems to be some common denominators. They never quit caring and cooking their own food. That's the big one. That's, the, that's one of the big denominators. Yeah. Now watch this. I, excuse me. I will watch people fight and resist their ability to lose weight at the very same time they tell me they want to lose weight. Here's how that will go. I'll say what I just said to you very honestly and openly. Oh, you got to carry your food. Listen to me. If you cook and carry your own food, your problem will go away. And the first thing they say, oh, I can't do that. I don't have time. I can't cook. See, the very thing they expressed that they wanted. Right, the weight loss. They have a wall. See, this is the mental part of it. Yeah. And so you have to point that out to them and then show them, as you just mentioned, there's places that will cook for it. Right. Here's, yeah, here's a solution. Let me show you three easy breakfasts that require no cooking. And let's start just with your breakfast. And you can do one of these three every morning. Oh, I got that down. Okay. Let's now just start with your, your mid-afternoon little mini meal. This is something you should carry to work. So we build upon successes. Whereas what dieting does- Small steps. 
Mm -hmm. reframing the problem. Yeah, dieting thrust everything on you all at once, like you're supposed to have all these skill sets. Well, it's like this this magic black and white, you know, change, you know, yeah. I mean, just so drastic from one day to the other, you know, right. and, and you just can't do that. You well, know? there's no other area of your life where you expect change to happen that way. You set out to buy a house one day. You didn't think it would happen overnight. You no. had to take the time to save. So everything we do to acquire and have change takes time, but it should not be a painful, difficult struggle right. like most right. people turn it into. Right, right. And and the way that you get around that is just by turning it into a process, reframing mm -hmm. the way that they mentally approach it and then just turning it into a process of small steps that lead to the desired actions. Well, let's take the pressure off of you that you have to do this within a certain time frame. Let's just take that off the table. Now, Keith, today, you, uh, I know that you coach a lot of people through uh, Lean Body Coaching, mm -hmm. which is an online uh, service, right. you know, for, for this very thing, you know, uh, dietary coaching, nutritional coaching, relapse prevention, and, and just, uh, you know, uh, full disclosure, you know, uh, I, I uh, am a big supporter and contributor to Keith right. with Lean Body Coaching, uh, I, you know, because it works, it helps mm -hmm. a lot of people can you kind of step people through what Lean Body Coaching does and how it might help them and where they can get more information. Well, it's everything we we're, we're talking about, right? So if you want to sign up, if you feel like this is something that would help you, we assign you your own coach because you so, have- So they get a life coach. Yeah. So first of all, they have to have somebody coaching them on changing their perspectives and skill sets and things like that. And so Lean Body Coaching, I, I'm retired from the clinical practice. What I wanted to have happen was to take what I did in the clinical practice and just move it all online. So everybody will have uh, videos that they watch that are educational, that teach you about food, food labels, and the psychology and relapse prevention. Um, but so, you, so, so it's like, a, like an online classroom. It's a six month classroom. Yeah, and then you can graduate from that, right? And you, you're, you're a member for life. So we also have a Facebook community that people share recipes on and talk and stuff like that. So it is my legacy, right? It's my pride and joy. Um, I feel like we're helping, we can help more people as with an online program than I ever could one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, uh, that's what we have. And all the coaches are nutritionists and they're all trained by me. They've all either worked with me at some point or they've trained under me for quite an extensive time. And they can find information on Lean Body Coaching where? Yeah, just uh, Google it, leanbodycoaching.com. Leanbodycoaching.com. Right. You guys make sure you check it out. Keith, what a pleasure Thank it you. is to uh, have you here today. This is great. Well, this is a pleasure because we were doing this on the hoods of our cars 40 years ago. When we were 19 years out old. Out of San Antonio Rose. Yes, yes, you know, when yes. We first met. And what, you were, what you're referring to, Keith, uh, for those of you that don't know, I've known Keith uh, uh, for, gosh, I'm dating myself here, I think for yeah. over 40 years. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and we met when uh, we were just literally teenagers. Yeah. And uh just getting started uh, as uh, bodybuilders, and, uh, yeah. and and here we are, almost a lifetime later, still doing the same thing. Yeah, and helping helping a lot of people yeah. along yeah. the way, and now uh, turning our attention to helping even uh, more yeah. thousands of people. How cool is that? To, well, I want to thank you for letting me be on here. Oh, thank it's, you very it's much. just totally my cool. pleasure, Keith. Uh, dude, this was so good today. Help us to grow the Lee Labrada show by recommending the show to at least one friend, and make sure that you hit the subscribe button so that you'll be alerted to more of these awesome podcasts like we had with Heath Klein here. And so uh, thank you guys so much. And, uh, you know, all right, get motivated, uh, get up, look up, and uh, we'll see you next time. God bless. The Lee Labrada Show.